Hello. My name is Ed Brightsford. I'm the Melanie S. Steele Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease in the Comparative Medicine Institute at the College of Veterinary Medicine, North Carolina State University. I'm also an adjunct professor of medicine at Duke University Medical Center in the Division of Infectious Disease. The topic of this module is Bartonelloses and Reservoir Host, bats, cats, dogs, mice, and men. In the context of disclosures, I hold a patent with Dr. Sushama Suntaki and North Carolina State University for a specialized insect-based growth media that we've used to enhance the growth of Bartonella species. I am also the co-founder, shareholder, and chief scientific officer for Galaxy Diagnostics, a company that provides advanced diagnostic testing for the detection of Bartonella species infections. I do not intend to reference any off-label or non-FDA approved usage in this presentation. Our learning objectives for this module are to describe flea transmitted Bartonella species for which feral and pet cats can be the reservoir host, to describe the canine adapted Bartonella species that have been implicated in association with human Bartonelloses, and to describe the role of rodent and bats as potential reservoirs for human infections. So this particular picture um, is how I've actually depicted my career as a veterinarian and being responsible for the health care of animals, essentially all creatures, great and small. Re regrettably, the, the genus Bartonella has um, dampened my enthusiasm for the picture in as much as we now know that rodents, dogs, cats, wildlife, and numerous wildlife species ruminant species, human beings, bats, and others are actually reservoirs for Bartonella and can be persistently infected with Bartonella and ultimately through either a vector, a bite, a scratch, or perhaps other mechanisms that we have not yet clarified transmitted those infections to humans. Now, it, it is possible that the veterinarian in this picture is a reservoir as well. And in that context, there are two Bartonella species, Bartonella bacilliformis in South America and Bartonella quintana, for which humans are thought to be the primary reservoir host. However, as we discussed in a previous module, we and others have documented Bartonella quintana in cats, in dogs, in fleas. And we've also documented Bartonella quintana in cinemologous monkeys that were being used for research purposes for drug development for humans. Subsequently, other investigators um, in China and areas where these monkeys are endemic have documented natural infection with Bartonella quintana. So, Although humans are a reservoir host, they are likely not the only reservoir host for Bartonella quintana. So in as much as many of your patients will be exposed to cats or to dogs and far fewer will be exposed to non-human primates um, or bats or rodents, we're going to first emphasize cats and then dogs and then go on to some of the other animal species out there that uh, at least gives us a perspective on how widespread Bartonella is in mammals throughout nature and how many opportunities there might be for exposure. So this particular slide is a summary of several manuscripts, and it's certainly not exhaustive, but after Bartonella hensley was found to be the cause of cat scratch disease by Russ Rignery at Centers for Disease Control, veterinary researchers around the world started looking at the bacteremic prevalence in cats. And one thing you have to understand about cats is that with Bartonella hensley and Bartonella chlorygiae, they tend to 
maintain levels of bacteremia that are anywhere from 10 to 1,000 times greater in number than would a dog, a human, or a horse maintain. So finding Bartonella by blood culture in cats as a reservoir host is not very difficult. And that would be true too of many of the rodent species where the level of bacteremia is very high. What you can see in this particular slide is that the, the highest percentage is actually from a study at, in our laboratory of CATS-19 belonging to individuals that had developed cat scratch disease. But if we look at stray cats in France, 53%, um, stray and veterinary hospital cats in Northern California in the area of Davis, California, where the University of California at Davis is located, um, 40%. And obviously when we get to the, the more Northern climates such as Germany, Japan, um, where the, it's a bit more temperate, um, the, the numbers tend to be much lower, but I would point out that we've got 56% um, in the Netherlands, and that's certainly a more Northern climate. But this is actually bacteremic prevalence, and you can see even Australia, which has some very unique Bartonella species as a function of the marsupials that have co-evolved with Bartonella on that continent, 35% uh, of the cats. And, and in most instances, these are Bartonella hensilae and Bartonella clerigiae. So one thing that is important in the context of considering a diagnosis of Bartonellosis in any patient is the fact that we knew back in the early 90s that Bartonella induced a chronic relapsing bacteremia in cats. And the study that Dorsey Cordig did, we actually had two blood donors, one that had induced neuroretinitis in the owner and the other had induced classical cat scratch disease um, in a father and son. Both of those cats were ultimately um, donated to us as part of our research and maintained until we got, adopted them out. Uh, the, the important point with those two cats and the studies that we did that I'm just gonna summarize by this erythrocyte with a Bartonella hensilae organism is that the pattern of bacteremia very early on is fairly predictable and is analogous to trench fever or five day fever. But the pattern of bacteremia tends to change as the duration of the infection lengthens and the pattern of the bacteremia was very different between SPF cats that got blood from donor one versus SPF cats that got blood from donor two. I, I mention this because in the context of documenting bacteremia, um, this can be very difficult and this will certainly be something that we'll discuss in a future module on diagnosis. And then I'm going to show you these cats on a subsequent slide, but the important point here is these cats um, all belong to the same owner. She happened to be the local cat lady and everyone knew that if they rescued a cat, found a stray cat, they could bring it to this owner. These were actually the family's pet cats and then they had a variety of other um, cats that ended up being strays of which this was one that had just had kittens before we bled everybody in this crate. And as you'll see on the subsequent slide, um, every adult cat was bacteremic and we managed to get enough blood out of one of the kittens to prove that it was bacteremic as well. So I, I often like to joke and say, these two were the ones that were the guilty ones that caused the child in this household to become infected. But in reality, it could have been any one of these cats that um, had scratched that individual during a play episode. So the, this was the very first study done by Perry Jamison at the, the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine. And why I included this particular slide is to emphasize the fact that if you're in a state anywhere along the coastal regions of the United States, 
um, you get a little dry area out here in Arizona, New Mexico, but the cat flea, um, Tenocephalus felis, is very much endemic throughout the entire coastal regions of the United States. When you get into the central portion of the country, uh, the, there's less of a problem. It's not to say that there's not a problem at all. And we'll come back to this when we talk about some of the epidemiological data that we've generated on dogs as reservoir hosts. So in the laboratory, we know that you can infect cats with Bartonella hensley, Bartonella clerigiae, and Bartonella cholerae, and those cats will remain infected um, for literally months in a laboratory setting. We also know that cats can likely be reservoirs for Bartonella bovis and Bartonella quintana. And the point that we made in the earlier module on vectors is that the flea that infests cats and infests dogs most frequently in the United States and throughout the world is the same flea that infests raccoons, possums, skunks, coyotes, foxes, and I also want to make the point on this particular slide that a study that was published several years ago where they bled stray cats and raccoons on an island off the coast of Georgia, the level of bacteremia in the two species was nearly identical at approximately 40%. So if you commingle cats with raccoons on an island in which there's fleas, you're gonna have at least about a 40% level of bacteremia. And, and I just emphasize this because it is so important that physicians obtain a vector history and a exposure history to animals that could be potential reservoirs for um, these particular bacteria. So these were the cats that were in the crate. And you can see that we ended up uh, several months after this person first got sick, bleeding them multiple times. And on all occasions, all the adult cats remain bacteremic. And the point we made yesterday was, this was very early work from our laboratory. And the unfortunate part uh, about um, what we found in patients that had developed cat scratch disease is almost all of those cats that we tested were bacteremic and they remain bacteremic for a very, very long period of time. Now, currently, based on CDC website and the best knowledge available, we believe that cats have to be infested with fleas and have flea feces on the surface of their coat to contaminate their saliva and contaminate their nails to facilitate transmission to a human. That best knowledge is based on laboratory studies where researchers have commingled cats that were bacteremic with cats that were specific pathogen free, not bacteremic and introduced, and those cats did not develop infection. But there is some concern that um, that may not be totally true in the context of the cat has to have fleas to be able to be competent as a vector. And I just wanted to, to point out that cats can develop atypical cat scratch disease if they're infected with a Bartonella species that they did not effectively co-evolve with. And in this instance, we have a cat that ultimately was diagnosed with Bartonella vinsonii subspecies Burkhoffi, osteomyelitis based on culture in the BAPGM enrichment culture platform. And I'll go into the more detailed aspect of this uh, cat's history in a subsequent mo module on pathogenesis. So that's all I'm going to cover in regard to cats and reservoirs. Again, there's about 90 million pet cats in the United States. So uh, as a physician, you're more likely to be seeing a patient whose family has a cat. Uh, dogs are up around 60 to 70 million in regard to the pet numbers. Uh, 
but uh, the, the good news for those of us who love animals and take care of them is people love their pets and there's a lot of people who have pets. So this is a, a study um, by Erin Lashnitz, a recent PhD student in the laboratory where she looked at the Vector Borne Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, which is located right here in the College of Veterinary Medicine Research Building. And this laboratory routinely tests for Bartonella henselae, Bartonella vinsonii subspecies, Burkhoffi, and Bartonella cholerae antibodies. Because as we'll see, these are the three most common Bartonellas that infect dogs and are likely the three most common Bartonellas that infect humans in the United States as well. And so what Aaron reviewed was nearly 16,000 diagnostic submissions that were sent in by veterinarians from uh, generally sick dogs. We do screen a small number of blood donors and it wasn't totally clear within the 16,000 how many might have been blood donors because that isn't on our report. Uh, or wasn't at the time, but is now. So one thing that I, I think is important to remember is we were actually selecting not from a random population, for, but from a population where a veterinarian suspected the possibility of a vector-borne disease, which could have been Ehrlichia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, et cetera. So one of the most important things for me as a veterinary internist from Aaron's study was the fact that when we looked at all three antigens, Bartonella henselae, Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi, and Bartonella cholerae, the overall prevalence amongst these 16,000 dogs was below 98% essentially. So what, what you can see is that in dogs, the specificity, and that's also based on other work that we've done with experimental infections, um, Western blotting and other modalities, but the specificity of IFA in dogs is extremely good. And the fact that we could test 16,000 dogs and 98% of them essentially not have antibodies or I guess I should say 97 because overall 3.26 had antibodies, um, really says that this is a very, very specific test. And currently the only organism I worry about as a veterinary internist when I'm talking to veterinarians that have a sick dog that is seroreactive to Bartonella is the possibility of brucellosis, which obviously is a somewhat different disease with somewhat different modes of transmission than the Bartonella species. So on th this particular slide, I just want to emphasize the fact that we could find seroreactive dogs pretty much throughout the United States. Again, the gray areas were excluded for the, from the study if there were less than 45 dogs uh, that we happened to test from those states. So you can see the Vector Borne Disease Lab is located in North Carolina. We get a lot of samples from the East Coast and a fair number of samples out of the South Central region of the United States and then lesser samples out of California and Oregon. But the Surprising thing, and again, this is where dogs, I think, will be extremely helpful. So CDC acknowledged a few years ago that the dog was likely the best naturally occurring animal to test for evidence of exposure to Borrelia burgdorferi. And if as a physician, you go to the CAPC website, which is the Companion Animal Parasite Council website, you can actually see data for dogs um, for heartworm, Ehrlichia, um, Anaplasma, and Borrelia for every state in the United States and Canada, and right down to the individual zip codes in which those samples, those dogs lived or resided or at least were tested. And, and why I say that's important is dogs spend a lot of time with us um, they tend to share both the household environment and the outside environment. And the 
one thing that's a bit different than dogs than us is that if they see um, a bunch of briars or woods or grass to run through, I think they're a little more inclined to run into areas where there are ticks uh, and be exposed than we are. So the, the point here is I think the dog and the dog data becomes very important. And surprisingly, if you look at the dog data, um, compared to the South Atlantic region, where we know from multiple studies that the highest seroprevalence and the highest number of cat scratch disease patients um, occur in the South Atlantic region, presumably because of cat contact, it was actually New England where we got the highest seroprevalence to these three Bartonella species. And this region out here, particularly in Oregon, um, was very high, the, the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, this area down in Texas and everything is um, pretty busy in Texas in the context of fleas, ticks, and vector-borne diseases. So our, our findings from this study, basically, um, there was a very low BVB seroreactivity in dogs throughout the United States. And Aaron's conclusion is it's unlikely the dog's a reservoir. I think that's a bit of a premature conclusion because we've grown Bartonella out of dogs um, for 18 consecutive months. So we know that dogs can remain bacteremic for at least a year and a half. Um, and I'll show you some more data on subsequent slides in regard to dogs and, and bacteremia. It's a, the, the highest risk in this and other studies is in male intact dogs and in mixed breed dogs. Again, we assume this is because the male dogs are more likely to um, be out in areas that they might otherwise not be, need to be in and mixed breed dogs oftentimes are um, not receiving the acaricide preventives for fleas and ticks that um, a bred, um, a, a dog that was bred by a breeder would, would tend to take good care of. So co-exposures with other canine vector borne diseases, which I didn't show you the data was very common, again, suggesting that vector transmission is occurring. There was no seasonal trend. And as I mentioned, exposure occurred throughout the United States. So this is a, a different study from Nandu Balakrishnan in our group. And this study was initiated um, to emphasize the importance of screening blood donors. The historically veterinarians screen blood donors for a number of tick-borne organisms, but screening for Bartonella um, has only been added to our list of organisms that we wanna make sure we're not transfusing in more recent years. And so first, I just wanna go through quickly some of the data and then make a few clarifications in regard to what, what you're seeing on this particular slide. So we essentially looked at 47 blood donors that were being screened to enter the blood donor program at NC State. Um, we then screened a group of healthy dog volunteers. Essentially, the college maintains a volunteer list where a dog may come in to do a orthopedic exam study or a participate in a pain study um, or provide blood for a, a cancer study or what have you. So these, these are essentially volunteers that um, help the, the college with various studies that are generally non-invasive. And then the other group was 21 stray dogs from a, a single um, local rescue group. So what, what you can see here is that in the blood donor screening group, 19% were bacteremic. And again, we're not reporting seroprevalence here. We're reporting the ability to find DNA of Bartonella. And that was 20% in group two, the healthy volunteers, and the stray dogs, 10%. And what you can see is these are the organisms that I've mentioned and the ones that we would expect to find 
in dogs that also have all infected humans. So Bartonella cholerae, Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi, genotypes one and two, and Bartonella henselae. In our laboratory, San Antonio 2 strain is the one that we most often identify in sick humans and in sick dogs. Also, a lot of these dogs were exposed to hematrophic mycoplasmas or Lichia ewingi. All were negative for spotted fever group rickettsia and Babesia by PCR testing. But I, I have to emphasize one point as you look at this data. So one take home message is that stray dogs and dogs that are rescued by veterinary students or veterinarians that are often become our blood donor candidates are oftentimes occultly infected with a Bartonella species. And so this is, is really biased by the fact that uh, a lot of our volunteers have rescued these dogs and a lot of our blood donor candidates are owned by veterinarians, veterinary technicians and others that are very close to the college that rescue these dogs. So basically we can say in North Carolina that somewhere between 10 and 20% of dogs in this category that are young and seemingly healthy can with very rigorous testing in a research environment be documented to have Bartonella bacteremia. Now, if, if we contrast that with sick dogs, and all these dogs were from North Carolina State University Veterinary Teaching Hospital accessions, mostly um, from the internal medicine service and mostly hand-picked for testing, um, because you can see this is, was published back in two, 2011. The, so this probably represented about four or five years of work. And that was 9.2%. And the point I wanna make again with this particular slide without most of these dogs would have been tested because we suspected polyarthritis, immune mediated hemolytic anemia, immune mediated thrombocytopenia, and immune mediated glomerulonephritis. But we, the predominant species was Bartonella henselae, followed by Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi, followed by Bartonella cholerae. And cholerae may be more common than most of our percentages in regard to bacteremia or seroprevalence actually reflect, just because it is a very difficult Bartonella compared to Henselae and Vinsonii burkhoffi to get it to grow in the laboratory. Also, I, I want you to notice this 18% co-infection because that is exactly what we find in regard to our human studies is if we target enough genes and we test enough samples, about 18% of dogs and 18% of humans are infected with a Bartonella. And again, in sick dogs that are bacteremic, only 25% of those had Bartonella henselae antibodies by IFA testing or 50% if they were infected with Vinsonii burkhoffi. So the good news about IFA is it's very specific. The bad news about IFA is the sensitivity is somewhere between bad and atrocious. So I, I wanna now talk about a situation in which it's highly likely that a veterinarian and his daughter were infected by their pet dogs. And the, this story was published in Parasites and Vectors in 2010. Um, the 52-year-old male veterinarian was a faculty member at the college at the time and was actually being seen by UNC Neurology. From the standpoint of those of us at the college, there was already questions, or you could say the rumor mill in the hallway was, gee, what's going on with so-and-so? Because it, it appears like he's lost a tremendous amount of weight, is very cachexic, and he looks like someone that should have cancer or HIV. And what the individual was experiencing was severe muscle weakness and incoordination, and that's the reason he was seeing UNC Neurology. By MRI, he had a poorly defined vascular lesion, and the rest of his story was, despite about nine months of diagnostic evaluations, 
uh, there was really no definitive diagnosis for his neurological symptoms. And so this individual approached me and said, Ed, I know you've been studying some veterinarians in regard to um, finding this new bacteria. Would you be willing to test me? And oh, by the way, my 12-year-old daughter, who was previously healthy and a straight A student, um, we just had to pull out of school because she's experiencing headaches, muscle pain, and insomnia. Um, there was the, the mother and two sons that were concurrently tested and they were negative and I'll now show you the father's results. And what, what you can see here is we talk about the BAPGM enrichment blood culture platform and we call this a platform because there's multiple steps. One part, the very first part is we extract DNA from the blood. The second is we take some blood, generally two mils into eight mils of BAPGM, and we culture that. And again, I note only two mils of blood is being inoculated um, for very specific reasons. And then we subculture out of these enrichment culture at 7, 14, and 21 days to see if we're lucky enough to get this bacteria to grow up on a blood auger plate as an isolate. And so the, the good news for this father, because he was the first one we tested, and if he would have been negative, 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 that would have probably been the end of the story in regard to our invo involvement. But fortunately, he was PCR positive from blood. It was sequenced, and it was a dog Bartonella or canine adapted Bartonella, Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi genotype 2, which is the most common Bartonella that we find in dogs and in humans when they're infected with Minnesotaii Burkhoffi genotypes. And you can see that he went back to UNC, this was 1018, after we related this result to get another blood collection and at the same time a CSF tap. The blood by direct PCR and the CSF after DNA extraction were negative, but both samples on either a seven 14 or 21 day cultured time point contain Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi genotype 2 DNA. Regrettably, we never got an isolate from him. Um, and what is also interesting about this veterinarian's history, and again, I'll emphasize this was a 52 year old, very healthy individual before this all started, is that when I reported these results back, he said, you know, Ed, the other thing that's happened to me that didn't exist before I got sick and started with these neurological symptoms was I'm having a lot of problems with periodontitis. And so we actually obtained an oral swab and a salivary swab. The oral swab essentially rubbed very hard along the gingival surface. And we were able to PCR amplify Bartonella vinsonii burkhoffi genotype 2 DNA from that swab. One of the reasons we did that is gingivitis stomatitis occurs in cats, often very young cats, and often in cats infected with Bartonella, and is thought to be perhaps one of the cofactors in the development of that disease process. But the other reason is another PhD student in my laboratory had PCR amplified multiple different Bartonella species out of dog saliva. So this was the first attempt to see if we could do that with human saliva. Once he was then treated by Chris Woods, an infectious disease physician at Duke, and once Chris started treatment, we retested him in January and actually grew Bartonella henselae. And based on his antibody titers, which I don't show you here, he was highly seroreactive to both Vinsonii burkhoffi and henselae back in October when we first started. So our presumption is he was infected with both. This was a predominant Bartonella species at an initial and we were able to identify it with our techniques. And then after treatment with um, doxycycline and rifampin for about four to six weeks, we were able to detect Bartonella henselae after which he was treated with a much longer course of antibiotics and had 98% resolution of his neurologic signs. So the next case is his daughter. And to a great extent, I'm very proud of this slide because I would argue that 
finding Bartonella in patient bloods without using an enrichment platform is extremely, extremely difficult and oftentimes very misleading. And the regrettable part about enrichment is, is it takes time. You can't submit a sample and get a result back the next day because on a research basis, we actually incubate for a minimum of 21 days. But what you can see here and why I make that statement is that I think our lab, having spent nearly 20 years looking at PCR primers, TAC polymerase, DNA extraction techniques, can do as good a PCR for Bartonella as any other commercial or research laboratory. And I would have argued that everyone would have done a PCR at these time points and said, this girl is not infected with Bartonella. But after enrichment culture, she was obviously infected with Bartonella. She was infected with the same Bartonella her father was infected with. And with her, in her case, we were lucky enough at one point to make a blood auger plate isolate where we actually got the organism to transit, transfer from this insect growth media into a blood auger plate. So as Paul Harvey would have said, well, what's the rest of the story? And the rest of the story is this all started when the two family pets, English Sp Springer Spaniels, were simultaneously hit by a car. And in the process, both the daughter and the father experienced exposure to blood and potentially some bites or scratches. They weren't totally sure because it had been some time, uh, almost a year earlier when that had occurred. So how they became infected and whether it was their pets that unfortunately had been killed by a car accident um, we, we'll never know, but that is what we suspected. And again, emphasizes how transmission might occur without a vector. So Bartonella and bats. Um, this is a super interesting story in as much as this 59-year-old man from Iowa um, developed aortic valve endocarditis and result his blood cultures, conventional blood cultures were negative. He got a new heart valve. And when they did PCR for various organisms that cause culture negative endocarditis, like Coxiella, Brucella, Bartonella, he was positive for Bartonella. But when the laboratory looked at the sequences, they didn't exist in GenBank which was problematic because if you can't compare a sequence you find in a patient's heart valve to bacterial sequences from over 36,000 bacteria in GenBank, um, I, I guess you could say, Houston, we have a problem. And that problem was solved um, by working with Dr. Raoul's lab in Marseille, where they actually targeted multiple um, Bartonella genes because the nice part about heart valves is they have a lot of organisms. So there's a lot of Bartonella DNA there. And they were able to amplify the necessary genes to say this is a new Bartonella candidate species, which becomes Bartonella mayotinensis. Interestingly, it's most closely related to the Vinsonii group. So Vinsonii Vinsonii, Vinsonii oropensis. Um, excuse me, and Vin Vinsonii burkhoffi. And why this was really interesting to those of us that are Bartonella researchers is the fact that there was no known vector and there was no known reservoir host, and yet we had someone that was infected with an organism that was definitively a new Bartonella. And so you can see in by 2014 in Emerging Infectious Diseases, a publication from Europe now identifies that Candidatus bartonella mayotinensis is in several species of bats in Northern Europe, and it clusters with this Northern Hemisphere group, which is literally a group of bats that are in Northern US, Canada, um, Eurasia, and in Europe. 
So again, how this individual from Iowa became infected with a bat Bartonella um, was never even speculated in the manuscripts. Again, when it was first identified, we didn't know that a bat was the reservoir. We do know now that bat flies are, which are essentially wingless flies on bats, are the vector for the bats. And so an individual receiving a bat bite, not only do we have to worry about rabies and other viruses, we now have to worry about Bartonella species, and this is not the only one that's been described in bats. So let's move on to rodents. And again, a, another really interesting study published in Emerging Infectious Disease, where what they tested were pet rodents being shipped into the United States to be distributed to various pet stores to be sold generally to very young children as what are fondly referred to as pocket pets. So essentially mice, rats, gerbils, squirrels, and chipmunks. These originated from eight countries, mostly in Asia, and 367 would have been wild captured and 179 had been bred in captivity. Again, essentially they were previously wild captured that were now being bred in captivity. So the overall prevalence of finding a Bartonella species in rodents that were going to pet stores was 26%. But if you were to look at the wild captured versus the breeder facility, um, it wasn't quite 50%, but it was a much higher percentage than I would want if I was buying a gerbil for my grandchild. So what you can see is Bartonella species were isolated from 61% of the animal specimens. Very interestingly, again, this group was able to document co-infection in 18%, which is the number we keep coming up with in dogs and humans if we do enough um, culture and genetic testing. And there was tremendous genotypic diversity amongst these various um, Bartonella species that, that were found. So rodents um, are clearly a problem and that has not been explored to any great extent in the United States or North America. But Dr. Michael Kasoy at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Colorado has done a number of studies, and I'm just gonna highlight two out of Southeast Asia. And these two studies were both in Thailand, one involving febrile human patients and the other involving stray dogs. So, what they were working with in the human patients were essentially blood clots from um, 261 patients that had been stored frozen. And 7.7% of those blood clots contained a Bartonella. If you did an enrichment culture in cell culture using Vero cells, so Vero E6 cells, and then using PCR to amplify the DNA after the incubation in the enrichment culture, and then targeting a gene that seems to preferentially uh, do a better job in our experience, and I think Michael's experience as well, in amplifying rodent Bartonella species. And again, for physicians, that's an important point because there are no two laboratories in the United States that are using the same gene target. Um, it's unlikely if they were using the same gene target that they would be using the same thermocycler or the same TAC polymerase or the reagents that essentially makes PCR work. So what I tell veterinarians and what I tell my medicine residents is a negative PCR has never ruled out the presence of an infectious agent in a patient. It only tells you that the laboratory was not successful in amplifying DNA of that suspected infectious agent. And I think that's an important message to keep in the back of the mind. If PCR is positive and it's done by a reputable laboratory, you can pretty much take it to the bank because laboratories have to be able to confirm these PCR results by one mechanism or the other if they're CLIA certified. Um, 
and so, but if it's negative, that's a whole different ball game. And what these were, were all rodent Bartonella species, essentially the same Bartonella species that a postdoc in Michael's laboratory, Dr. Bai, managed to find in stray dogs using our BAPGM enrichment blood culture and ITS PCR. And in this instance, this is Bartonella valencia, Elizabethi, Grammii, and Taylori, all of which are found in rats, mice, and squirrels. And one in dogs that we've mentioned a couple times is Bartonella quintana, which is supposed to only be in humans as a reservoir, but that's not totally true. So to finish up our rodent conversation, there is one very interesting um, study by Dr. Welch in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology in 1999 that honestly has never been followed up on to any extent um, to my knowledge. And, and I'll explain why I said that after we go through this particular case. So this is a 62-year-old cattle rancher from Wyoming that <clears throat> at the time this Bartonella vinsonii oropensis was identified, had an acute onset of headache, confusion, difficulty walking, and facial numbness. But his medical history was really, really interesting in as much as this gentleman had been sick since 1960. You can see this was published in 1999, so his workup was during 97, 98. And what he had was positive anti-nuclear antibody levels, elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rates, positive rheumatoid factor, positive, sorgen, positive for sorgen syndrome, and a polyneuropathy that developed in 1960. This is a quote directly from the manuscript. The rheumatological syndrome is also characterized by variable neurologic manifestations, including aseptic meningitis. Relapses are managed by high-dose intravenous steroids. In 1987, he was treated with prednisone for a presumed relapse of vasculitis when he presented with vertigo, headache, and numbness of the hands. And I think we are increasingly understanding that Bartonella can cause very chronic, very long lasting infections in humans as we've been able to document in cats and dogs and likely some other animal species. And why I say it's, we now know that Vinsonii oropensis is distributed in Paramiscus leucopus um, throughout the United States and even has been reported in rodent species in Mexico. And so I think this organism probably induces infection far more often than has been recognized. Um, and it's being a rodent Bartonella species, it is probably very difficult to detect in a human patient. And the fact that this person was being treated with immunosuppressive drug therapy is likely the reason that the isolate was successfully made in this instance. So to finish up our conversation on the complexity of reservoirs, this was an, another interesting story for us because Dr. Maggi, um, Ricardo Maggi, who's worked with me for the past 17 years as a research scientist, had made two isolates one from a patient in Southern California who had pericarditis. And that woman actually lived on a very, very large farm that had a menagerie of wild animals, domestic animals, and livestock. Um, and the other was actually a woman that resided in North Carolina, worked in a veterinary hospital, but had received some type of bite wound at a family gathering in Ohio about eight months earlier and developed a very large erythematous lesion on her thigh and then developed what she described as essentially chronic fatigue syndrome. She just was constantly fatigued and all of this occurred after this trip to Ohio to spend with family and friends. So a, a little bit like the, the bat story to a certain extent, Ricardo makes this isolate and he tells me, Ed, 
there's nothing in GenBank that matches this. And then he makes this isolate and sequences a couple of genes for Bartonella that should have told us what Bartonella species and strain it was, and still nothing in GenBank. And fortunately, again, I mentioned Michael Kasoy in regard to all the rodent work, and Mike's done a lot of bat work as well uh, in the earlier slide, but Mike was looking at vectors um, on rodents and on um, ruminants, cattle as well as sheep and deer. And we, I had mentioned keds or wingless flies are responsible for the transmission amongst deer and sheep. And he deposits a sequence in GenBank that he generates out of sheep keds that is very unique. Uh, Dr. David Bemis is the head veterinary microbiologist in their diagnostic lab at the University of Tennessee Veterinary School. And David got sheep blood in. He poured plates to use to culture patient samples and bacteria grew up on the plates. Interestingly enough, we had had that happen to us as well. And we weren't smart enough to sequence the bacteria on the plates. We considered them contaminants, worried about them contaminating other things in our lab and threw them out immediately. Um, or appropriately discarded them, I should have said. So what then we find in GenBank is sequences deposited by, deposited by Dr. Bemis from sheep blood. And the long and the short that was published in Emerging Infectious Disease is the sequence in sheep heads and in sheep blood and in these two patient isolates are 100% identical. So these individuals in some way were infected with a sheep reservoir Bartonella species that we were fortunate enough to be able to isolate with the techniques that we were using in our research laboratory. So in the previous module, we emphasized vectors, um, the ones that we know, the flea, the louse, the tick, the sand fly, um, and some of the ones that we suspect. I hope in this module, you've come to an appreciation for reservoirs. And again, I'm using endocarditis as our base because obviously if a patient has endocarditis, we don't have to debate the diagnosis and causation is far more likely. So we've got rabbit Bartonella's, bat Bartonella's causing endocarditis in humans as well as ground squirrels in Southern California, um, rats in Baltimore, Maryland, and other parts of the world. Um, and so I hope through this, we have communicated the following points of importance. One, there is a large and diverse pet and wildlife reservoir for Bartonella species in nature. Two, numerous reservoir adapted Bartonella species, at least 38, and now we're probably closer to 43, of which 17 have been associated with pathology in cats, dogs, or humans. Co-infection with more than one Bartonella species is not unusual in reservoir hosts and occurs in association with disease in both dogs and humans. And it's important for physicians to obtain a detailed history of vector exposures and animal exposures for any patient with a chronic illness um, for which you're trying to determine could Bartonella be an ideology. And so here, I just want to say that the cons consult I did yesterday for a veterinarian was for a golden retriever that was flown in from Turkey. So there is a group, a, a rescue group in the United States that is rescuing golden retrievers. Um, most of the people with golden retrievers in the United States tend to keep their golden retrievers, but for some reason um, they end up being abandoned in Turkey and are actually flown to the United States to be adopted. If we talk about this translocation and spillover, I think again, spillover from a bat to a human is obviously a, a very important concept that hopefully we discussed. And then the most important thing is most of you are physicians that see patients one at a time. And I'm an internist, I'm not an epidemiologist. I see my patients one at a time. My patients, oops, excuse me, are right here in the middle of this circle. 
and I have to consider their exposure to other domestic animals, their exposure to wildlife, their travel history, and their vector exposure. And with that, again, I want to thank all the people in our laboratory that have done the work. I had mentioned the blood donor study by Dr. Balakrishnan, um, Mardula Varian's work, Ricardo, Ricardo Maggi's work um, with the sheep blood. And with that, I would say these are the references that were specifically cited in this module. Um, and I hope that this will be of help to you um, the next time you see a patient. Thank you very much.